So I'm going to be talking about police misconduct this evening. So generally, police are believed to uphold a higher moral and ethical code. I guess I think everybody would agree. As enforcers of the law, we trust them to protect our lives and our rights. However, I'm proposing that police are increasingly using militarized tactics and violating the civil rights of citizens. So before I get into my evidence, I have some definitions for you guys. I'll define civil rights, which includes ensuring people's physical safety. It protects from discrimination based on mental disability, gender, and religion. It protects individuals' freedom from un unwarranted government infringement. I also am going to define the First and Fourth Amendments because they're the ones that are typically being violated in these cases. So the First Amendment prohibits interfering with the right to peaceably assemble or, pe or petition the government for redress of grievances. The Fourth Amendment guards against unreasonable search and seizures, along with requiring any warrant to be supported by a probable cause. And I'm also going to define militarization, which in this case is officers outfitted in riot gear, armed with tear gas, pepper spray, and flashbang grenades, in addition to their lethal weapons, using militarized tactics and aggression. Um, I have a picture of militarized police. You guys can pass that around so you get an idea of exactly what we're dealing with. So I have some numbers from the National Police Misconduct and Statistics Reporting Project that show that there were 3,445 reports of misconduct in 2009. In 2010, the number jumped to 4,861 reports. One of the reasons why military, militarization has increased was due to the 9-11 to the terrorist attacks. And I have a quote from Al Baker of the New York Times that says, what seems clear is that the terrorist attacks of September 11th and the federal homeland security dollars that flowed to police forces in response to them have further encouraged police forces to embrace paramilitary tactics. And what paramilitary means is basically um, something that is similar to the military but not under it exactly. Baker goes on to say that they have tanks. Yes, tanks often from military surplus for use in hostage situations or drug raids. Not to mention the sort of equipment and training one would need to deter a Mumbai style guerrilla assault. So I'm gonna use an example from the police at UC Davis who were using such tactics and violating the right to peaceably assemble in their use of pepper spray on peaceful protesters. There's a quote from Bob Ostertag, professor uh, at UC Davis, in reference to prison inmates' rights. He said, that regulations prohibit the use of pepper spray on inmates in all circumstances other than the immediate threat of violence. If a prisoner is seated, by definition, the use of pepper spray is prohibited. Any prison guard who used pepper spray on a seated prisoner would face immediate disciplinary review for the use of excessive force. Now, the students at UC Davis in this case were seated and proposed no threat of violence whatsoever. And apparently, they had less rights than prison inmates. I have another example of a violation of civil rights. When police beat an autistic boy in Chicago after he declared that he was disabled. So Lolly Bowie, a writer with the Chicago Tribune, wrote that on Wednesday night, officers pursued Guzman, the autistic boy, inside his family's fast food restaurant in the Little Village neighborhood. The boy, who has the mental capacity of a fifth grader, was yelling, I'm a special boy, as he fled, and his parents told the officers he was a special boy with special needs. One of the officers struck Guzman in the head with a baton, cutting a gash that would require eight staples. This is an example of the aggression that stems from such military-style training and also a violation of civil rights. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Occupy movement, but that's definitely where a lot of this misconduct has been demonstrated, especially in Oakland. A uh, former Iraq war veteran received serious brain injuries after being hit in the head with a tear gas canister. And officers were outfitted in full rag gear and also used flash brain grenades. And if you've seen any of the videos on YouTube, it looks like a war zone. It's pretty scary. So I have, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit against the Oakland PD, and I have a quote from the Huffington Post that says, on two recent occasions, October 25th and November 2nd, 2011, the Oakland Police Department and cooperating police agencies under their discretion indiscriminately shot flash brain grenades and other projectiles into crowds of occupied Oakland protesters. These actions clearly violate the Fourth Amendment by subjecting protesters who pose no safety concerns to unnecessary and excessive force, and the First Amendment by interfering with demonstrators' rights to assemble and demonstrate. Uh, just in closing, I have another quote from Norm Stamper of The Nation. Who, and this is also in reference to the Seattle Occupy movement where protesters were lined up on the sidewalk, which is legal to protest. If they got into the street, it would be illegal, but most of them were on the sidewalk. He said, police response to the Occupy movement, most disturbingly visible in Oakland, 
where scenes resemble the war zone and where a Marine remains in serious condition from a police projectile brings into sharp relief the acute and chronic problems of the American law enforcement. Seattle might have served as a cautionary tale, but instead, U.S. police forces have, be, have become increasingly militarized and it's showing in cities everywhere. The NYPD coating innocent people with pepper spray, the arrests of two student journalists at Occupy Atlanta, the declaration of, pro of public property as off limits, and the arrests of protesters for trespassing. So in conclusion, it's clear that the police often approach situations with the wrong tactics and unfortunately step on people's rights in the process. All right, uh, you just state the proposition pretty clearly. It did sound like it had multiple points to it. There needs to be a clearer structure of what the supporting points are going to be going after. Um, in the body of the speech, I can see that there is this movement toward militarization as the cause of these particular problems, and I think that that needs to be uh, signaled early on in the speech, and maybe even that should become uh, the focus of the argument, because there's not much dispute that uh, incidents happen Happen. The question is, why do they happen? And you're making the argument that it's happening because of either the training or the way that they have been equipped instead of it being the context or the confrontations that they've had in these situations. Basically, the argument is that the cops are, you know, uh, you know, loaded for bear, and so whenever they run into uh, a, a conflict, they're likely to respond in an overly uh, militaristic way. Um, the I didn't think that you had much evidence that suggested such a link until you got to uh, the end of the speech and you talked about the tactics that were used in Oakland and you have the ACLU quotes and then you also had a couple of closing quotes that suggested that there was a link between the militarization. Both of those I think are, are better at, citing, at uh, creating this causality connection than any of the stuff that you had earlier. Uh, I'm not exactly sure for instance about the special boy running around and whether or not that was uh, related to uh, militarized, militarized tactics. The, um, the vet at the Occupy uh, site that got hit with the um, canister, that's part of the confrontation that's going on there, and so that's an illustration that might work on that point. Um, the pepper spray thing, I, you have to show, for instance, that that is, uh, was within policy or that there aren't... Uh, What's, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Disciplinary measures. Because in essence, you say in prison that would be, uh, they'd be subject to disciplinary measures. Well, what's going on in the situation at Davis? Was there in fact any discipline taken or was the officer involved in doing that exonerated and it's, it's been accepted that he was acting within policy? I think that's where you need to develop that argument a little bit more. Like I said, I thought that the most of your argument is kind of backloaded. It, it's not until you get to the end of the speech that you really connect with the militarization issue, and I think that's where most of your controversy is. All right, thank you.